I'd like for you to take your Bibles tonight and turn to 1 Samuel, please. Chapter 3. Mrs. Phil Dean, Phil and his wife Terry are in Oklahoma, the limb leaders of the state of Oklahoma. Terry is a WACOR grad, graduate, and she was one of the recipients of the degrees this afternoon. And she is also a United States gold medal figure skating champion. This is her gold medal for being the United States figure skating champion. This gold medal has been given to the Way Ministry and it will be placed in our Fine Arts and Historical Center. It, there it will be on exhibit. And in a letter that she wrote some of the feelings about winning this gold medal I would like to read. She said, as I was standing on the ice with the judges around me, only two feet from the finish line, I was fully prepared by hours of work. I realized that these next two hours would culminate 15 years of practice and preparation for this gold medal test. My number of skating hours had increased to an average of seven hours a day for four years. My time on the ice was spent with meticulous attention to detail, striving by repetition and concentration for perfection. My professional instructor was an ardent disciplinarian, greatly concerned with detail, and he required my utmost on and off the ice. He would never accept less than my best. Naturally, I won the gold medal. Fifteen years and countless hours of life are now represented by this small gold medal. Our God so loved that he gave his only begotten son, Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ so loved that he laid down his life for us. Can I now spend any less time, put forth any less effort than I did those 15 years for a gold medal in figure skating? I now serve a God who so loved that he gave. We are to walk worthy of the vocation to which God called us. For our rewards, for our faithful walk, are eternal. A crown of glory that fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for us, and not a temporal gold medal. Can we do any less than give our utmost for his highest. Can we? Tonight, the 33rd anniversary of the Way Ministry, and I'd like to share a little bit about the vision and its simplicity. In 1 Samuel chapter 3 and verse 1, it said, And the child Samuel ministered unto the Lord before Eli. Eli was the old prophet of God. Samuel was just a youngster. He perhaps was not hardly old enough to have even made it in the way court. Eli had been the prophet for many, many years. But Eli had sort of flipped on his responsibilities. He had forgotten to raise up his children in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. 
He had neglected to correct them when he should have corrected them. And so he just sort of spiritually cooled off. And this young man, Samuel, was the one who served under Eli and ministered unto Eli. And if you remember the story of Samuel born to Hannah, at the time of her conception, she dedicated this young man to be born to the service of the Lord. And it was this Samuel who ministered unto the Lord before Eli. It gives you a little background. And the word of the Lord was precious in those sites, in those days. The word precious means costly. It was a high price, so to speak. The reason the word of the Lord was precious, costly, in those days was because the man of God had slipped out. He was not faithful to God's word. It was costly because there was no word of God available. As it says, there was no open what? vision. That means there was no knowledge, no revelation available, not because God could not give, but because there were not men to believe for God to give so that the men could receive. In the record of Malachi, in that period of time between Malachi and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, approximately 400 years there was not one man of God that had vision with knowledge by revelation. Not one. 400 years. Next year we will celebrate 200 years in the United States and we think that's a long time. It is, but it's only half as long as 400. 400 years, not a man of God. Just think about that for a moment. Here, there was an old prophet, an old man of God, but he had copped out. He wasn't walking. He hadn't moved. That's why there was no open vision, no knowledge. And it came to pass, verse 2, at that time when Eli was laid down in his place and his eyes began to wax dim. Two things in here. He's going to go to bed. He's going to go to sleep at night and it's telling us he's an old man that he could not what? And ere the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord. You see, in the temple they had a light, a lamp with wax in it and oil in it, and that lamp at way in the front of the temple, like up here we have the Word of God, the will of God, there'd be that lamp, and that lamp was never allowed to go out. As long as there was a man of God, as long as the Word of God was there, then the light was to shine. In some of the churches in your background, you have a lamp hanging up in front and it has a light in it, still symbolic of this record that I'm reading to you tonight from 1 Samuel. That lamp of God would have gone out had Eli died. So before, ere, E-R-E, -E, before the lamp of God, before Eli died, before the lamp of God went out in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was, Samuel was laid down to sleep. Then the Lord called Samuel, and he, Samuel, answered, Here am I. And he ran unto whom? Eli. Samuel thought it was Eli calling him. So when he heard this voice, you know, Samuel! Samuel said, I, here I am, and he jumped out of bed, headed toward all these rooms to where Eli was. He ran unto Eli, and he said, Here am I, for thou callest me. 
And he said, Eli said, I didn't call you. I called not. Go lie down again. And he, Samuel, went back to his bedroom, and what did he do? Laid down. Right. Verse 6. And the Lord called yet again, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel arose and ran to where? Went to where? Yeah, went right back to old Eli's place, bedroom. And he said, Eli, here am I. For thou didst call me, I heard it. And Eli answered, I didn't call you my son. I called not my son. Yeah. Go on, lie down. You know, I didn't call you. That's right. Look at verse 7. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord. There's a great statement. That does not mean that he didn't worship God. Uh, by the way, this is a section I teach in the advanced class. So for those of you who have never had the advanced class, when you get in the advanced class, that night I won't have to teach you. See? <laughs> Bless your heart. Did not yet know the Lord. Did not yet know how to receive revelation. How to receive knowledge from God. It was costly. The word of the Lord was costly in those days. There was no open what? Vision. No revelation. No knowledge coming from God. And that's what it means. Samuel did not yet know the Lord. He did not yet know how to receive revelation. He never received any. Didn't know how. Here the Lord was calling said, Samuel, and he thought it was Eli. So he trounces over there, trips over there, says, Eli, you called me. He said, no, man, I did not call you. So he goes back to sleep, and the Lord called him again. That's why I know he said, Samuel, Samuel, the second time is again, see? And then he heads over to Eli, and Eli said, now, don't bug me any longer, he, uh, you know. I didn't call you man. See? He did not yet what? Know the Lord. Neither was the word of the Lord yet what? Revealed. There is it. There it is. And the Lord called Samuel again what? The third time. Samuel! 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 <laughs> Three times says so. Third time. And he arose and went back to where? Eli, and said, Here am I, for you did call me, for thou didst call me. And Eli perceived, Well, praise the Lord. <laughs> Finally, it gets through to him that the Lord had called the child. Now, the word child does not mean that he was still on the bottle. He was not so immature. It means youngster, you know. Tonight, I told you at the 33rd anniversary here how I got, how we got 33 carnations from one of my kids. Now, that kid could be 40 years old or 30 or 29. See, these are phrases, figures that are used. Eli perceived that the Lord had called the child. Therefore Eli said unto Samuel, Go lie down, and it shall be, if he call thee, that thou shalt say, Speak, Lord, for thy servant what? Oh boy, what a tremendous thing. He simply said the next time something like this occurs, just relax yourself and say, Speak, Lord, speak, Lord, for your servant heareth. What a fantastic thing. We talk about the vision in simplicity of the ministry that God has given us. How simple it is. 
Samuel was a servant. You are not a servant. You, by, if you're born again, you're a what? Son of God. Would God do less for a son than he would for a servant? I doubt it. Would you? Would you do less for your boy or your girl than you would for some servant you had in your household? I doubt it. Eli said, when God calls, just simply say, Speak, Lord, speak, Lord, for thy servant heareth. What a tremendous key. That's the simplicity of it. We have to learn to recognize God's voice, God's knowledge, the word of God, the knowledge that is in God's word. And we simply say again, speak, Lord, for your sons and your daughters are listening. That's the time in which you and I live. That's the media, the outreach of God's word that I'm concerned about in the vision and the simplicity on this, the 33rd anniversary of this ministry, that we continue to hear God's word, that we hear the voice of God, and that we simply say, Lord, speak. Not Eli speak. Not VP where will speak. Not the head politician or banker or farmer or factory man speak. But Lord speak. Lord speak. We've been listening to too many other voices through the centuries. We in the way ministry have to continue to come back to God and his word. And we again have to say in our day and in our time, Lord, speak for thy son or thy daughter heareth. Heareth what the Lord has to say. Watch it. So Samuel went and lay down his place, verse 10, the Lord came and the Lord, what? That's significant. Absolutely significant. Whenever there are believers ready to receive the greatness of God's word, God always stands. Sometimes think his muscles must have hurt from sitting down so long. He stood, says, a significant, very significant thing. Because when, when God stands in God's word, it's always like God bearing his arms to fight for his children, to be their shield and their buckler. Isn't it in the book of Acts where Stephen had a little prayer and somebody stood up in heaven? You don't fight too good sitting down. You got to stand for something. Any stupid fool can sit around and say, well, my wife can have my believing faith for me. My husband can believe for me. Or my wife can believe for our kids. Oh, she can go to church. She can be the religious one. I don't have to be. See, that's cop out. And God will never bring his word to pass until men believe that word, and then God stands to share that word with his people. I know God has been standing in our day and time, but I want to see the greater outreach of God's word through more committed men and women to really believe God's word and again say, Lord, speak, Lord, speak, speak, Lord. The Lord, for thy son or thy daughter heareth. And he called at other times, Samuel. Samuel, then Samuel said, answered, speak, for thy servant heareth. And the Lord said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel. The Lord wasn't just such a square. 
He had his thing, too, right? <laughs> we think we're so modern, you know, our young people are going to do their thing. The Lord did that long before you young people were ever thought about. <laughs> he did his thing. He said, that thing I'm going to do at which both the ears of everyone in Israel that heareth it, they're going to tingle. <laughs> they're going to have a ringing in the ears because of what the Lord's going to do with his thing. He said, in that day I'll perform against Eli all things which I have spoken concerning his house. When I begin, I'll also make an end. For I have told him that I would judge his house forever for the iniquity which he knoweth, because his sons made themselves vile, and he restrained them not. And therefore I have sworn on the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be purged with sacrifices nor offering forever. Verse 15, and Samuel lay until morning. He doesn't say he went back to sleep. I'll bet he never went back to sleep. Here was his first major revelation. Direct from God Almighty who created the heavens and earth in all of its simplicity and all of its beauty. He heard from the Creator, the God of Adam and Eve and all born-again believers today spoke to him. And it was like he heard it in his senses, ears. Right. When the message was all over with, old, Eli, uh, old Samuel just lay there until morning. And in morning, he went and opened the doors of the house of the Lord. That was one of his jobs, to unlock the Bible center and put the flags up and get things rolling. And Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. He didn't want to tell Eli what God had told him. And I can understand this because the Word of God says that even a copped out prophet, you don't lay a hand on him. Sort of neat. David had many opportunities to destroy Saul, but he never touched him. Many opportunities, if you read the word. Why did he not destroy Saul? Saul was after David's life a number of times, and yet David had an opportunity to destroy Saul. He never did. Why? Because at one time Saul had been God's chosen, because Saul chose to walk. And because he had been that at one time, David never laid a hand on him. Because someplace in the word it says that this man of God was like the apple of God's eye. And you don't like to get hit in your eye. It doesn't feel so good. That's why Samuel just didn't want to tell Eli. Eli had been the prophet, still was a prophet. Because once you're a prophet, you're always a prophet even if you're copped out. You know, once you're a boy, you're a boy, even if you go to Sweden, I guess, or they do, but I'm fair of that now. But then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son? And he answered, Here am I. And he said, What is that thing that the Lord hath said unto thee? I pray thee, hide it not from me. God do so to thee and more also, if thou hide anything from me of all the things that he said unto thee. And Samuel told him every whit and hid nothing for him from him. And he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth good. And Samuel grew, and the Lord was with him, and let, did let none of his words fall to the ground. Isn't that tremendous? The Lord was with him. And he did not allow any of Samuel's words to fall to the ground. That's a figure meaning that whenever Samuel spoke, and it was the word of the Lord which he spoke, God saw to it it was carried out. He allowed none of the words of Samuel to fall to where? The ground. 
Would God do any less for his sons when we speak the word? In Proverbs, Psalms, Proverbs, 29, In verse 18 of King James, it says, Where there is no vision, the people perish. The old ancient text reads, Where there is no knowledge of God, the people wander aimlessly. Look at our day and look at our time. The communities you represent where there is no knowledge of God, the people wonder how. And that's why you see so many people wandering so aimlessly. For there is no knowledge of what? Right. There's a lot of religion. You've got them like filling stations every other corner. But they're out of fuel because they're out of the Word. And when you're out of the word, you're out of spiritual fool. Because it's food. The word is the food. Right. Where there is no knowledge of God, no vision, no knowledge of God. Now this vision was revelation that Samuel had, but with it came that knowledge of God's will. And you can never know God's will without knowing God's word whether it's from the revealed word written here or whether it is by revelation, word of knowledge, word of wisdom, and discerning of spirit. Before you can know the will of God, you have to know the word of God. And before you can know the word of God, you have to be taught how to receive that word. Our ministry is a ministry of teaching the people. We don't lecture them. We don't jump on them. We teach. We're a research and teaching ministry. God, you get tired of teaching. Doesn't say if you get tired, you quit. It says teach. That's right. I get so sick and tired of teaching the core at times. I wish somebody else had the core. You know. They don't even know which end of a shovel's the right end. They don't even know how to break hoses off at the hydrant. They don't know how to start a Cushman. They don't know how to keep a Chevrolet engine running in an automobile without choking it four times and starting it each time in the morning. Well, I'll bet some of you don't know very much more either. Ooh, 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 ooh. <laughs> So we're a teaching ministry. And without that teaching ministry of God and his word, there'll be no knowledge. And without knowledge, the people wander aimlessly. It's like the Old Testament would say, like sheep without a what? Shepherd. Sure. It is our ministry to hold forth the simplicity of the word, making known the vision or the knowledge of that wonderful word of God. There's a record in Isaiah chapter 1 that I think speaks loudly tonight also to our people. Isaiah chapter 1. The vision of Isaiah the son of Amos, which he saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. In the days of Uzziah, Jotham, Ahaz, and Hezekiah, kings of Judah. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth. For the Lord hath, past tense, what? Spoken. The Lord hath spoken. I have nourished, and I brought up children, and they have, what? Rebelled against. The ox knoweth his owner, and the ass his master's crib. But my children 
they don't know the ox as half as much as the ox or the ass. They do, do not know. My people don't even consider. And yet I am the Lord, and I have what? Spoken. The ox knows his owner. The ass knows how to get back to where the food is, his crib. But Israel don't recognize my voice, and they don't know where the food is at all. That makes the ox and the ass smarter than God's people. Boy, what a, what a laying it on them, huh? Man, oh man, that that stupid ox is smarter than God's people. That that stupid ass is smarter than God's people. At least the ass knows where the food is. God's people run around eating all the other stuff except the word. So I said, oh, sinful nation, a people laden with iniquity, a seed of evildoers, children who are corruptors, they have forsaken the Lord. That's why there was no vision, no knowledge. They have provoked the Holy One of Israel unto anger. They are gone away backwards. And that's the only way you can go without the knowledge of God's Word. That's right. Look at chapter 6. In the year that King Uzziah died, I, Isaiah, saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. Above it stood the seraphim. Each one had six wings. With twain he covered his face, with twain he covered his feet, and with twain he did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And the posts of the door moved at the voice of him that cried. And the house was filled with smoke. Then said I, Isaiah, woe is me, for I am undone, because I am a man of unclean lips. What a cry of a prophet, a man of God. The children of Israel had wandered away from God. The man of God was there holding forth God's word, but no response to God's word. Very little. You know, one here, one there. But not what God should have expected. And what God was entitled to. The ox knows his master, the ass the, the, ass, the master's crib knows how to get back there. But my children, they don't know. And the man of God said, woe is me, for I am undone. I'm a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me, Isaiah, having a live coal in his grip, hand, grip, and he had, which he had taken with the tongs from off the altar. And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send, and who will go, with, go for us? Then said I, Here am I, Lord, send me. Right. This is a tremendous record in the Old Testament. Took that coal off of the altar, put it on the lips of the prophet, 
and the fire representing the fire of God, the purity of God. And he said, I have taken away thine iniquity. And your sin is purged. Then he said, Whom shall I send? Who will go for us? That's the question he asked. After he had purified the prophet, after he had cleansed him, put the coal of fire on his lips and told him exactly what it stood for. He heard that voice of the Lord saying, well, who am I going to send? Who's going to speak for me to the children of Israel? And the man of God said, here am I. Send me. One girl spent 15 years, seven hours a day to win this. And people, that's all she got out of it. All she got out of it. How long could you live eating this tonight? 15 years and up to seven hours a day of discipline and you heard what she said about her professional instructor not only on the ice but off of the ice she was not allowed to go to a late show she couldn't have pizza she could never have a bottle of beer she worked what for a gold medal in figure skating. How much time have you spent in God's Word studying to show yourself approved by rightly dividing? How much, how many hours a day have you given? Seven hours a day? Fifteen years? Our people in our United States and all over the world, people are dying for there is no knowledge of God's Word. And where there is no knowledge of God's Word, God's people wonder how aimlessly. Well, who's going to go? Who's going to speak? Those who have their lips cleansed with the fire of God and that's even deeper in our day, for you're born again of God's Spirit. You have Christ in you, the, the hope of glory, the fullness of the Spirit. And remember what he said about the coming of the Spirit, that he would fire the burn out the dross out of a man's life. Whom shall I send? Who will go for me? And Isaiah said, Here am I. Send me. Until you come to that place, you're always saying, well, send my neighbor. Yeah. Send Johnny Jump Up or Henry Boloco. Let him go W.O.W. -W. Let him do the witnessing. I'll go back to the factory and shop. I'll make the money and support him. That's a cop out. You make the money. Eat it. Eat it. How long are you going to live on money? Uh, if we were that smart, the Arabs, we'd get our oil cheaper. Let them drink it a while. <laughs> they haven't got the food to feed their people. We have to give it to them. Who's going? Until you realize what God has done for you and you become real knowledgeable of God's word and really be believe God's word, you're always going to say, well, send somebody else. This man came to the place and he said, here am I, send me. That's the vision I have 
on this 33rd anniversary for the outreach of God's Word, not only in these, our United States, but around the world. Say, man shall not live by what? Bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Remember the scripture of the Apostle Paul that he didn't speak the word of God with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration and what? Power. Let your light so shine before men that they may see. Right. Here am I to what? Send me. I think that's the clarion call for all of God's people not only here in this great auditorium and in international on this 33rd anniversary Sunday night, but for all of God's people around the nations of the world, anybody who knows God and is known of him, whose lives have been changed because they're born again, I think you've got to say, here am I, send me. And then you better be like Abraham. Go. Even though you may not know whither you're going. We'll have to be like Paul. We'll have to be like Peter. We'll have to be like Dorcas and a lot of the beautiful women of God. Once again, just hold forth the greatness of that revelation of God's word. Thirty-three years, looks like a long time, especially if you're 14. 200 years, a little longer. 400 is even longer. We're just not even started. We barely come to the first rung of the ladder of the outreach of God's word if our people just stay faithful. And they simply say, here am I, send me, send me. If one person told me this this week, I would say a dozen have told me that they now understand why I get so excited about the W.O.W. program, because now they're out on the field and they're excited. The reason I get excited is because they're out there holding forth God's word. They're speaking God's word. Now, they may not know too much about it, but I want to tell you something. They know more than 99 and 9 tenths percent of the, quote, Christian, end of quote, in the community where they go. Because about all we know is Christianity today in these communities is what we've been fed from one man's mind to another, and not, ma'am, what the Word of God says. And Christianity is what the Word of God says. Not what you may say about it or I may say about it, but what does it say? That's Christianity. And the reason our WWs are exciting to me, because they have the guts, the audacity, the intestinal fortitude. How do you like it, baby? To hold forth God's word, that's it. And it isn't how much you know, it's how accurate you hold forth what you do know. Here am I, send me. That I think's the cry tonight on this 33rd anniversary. Here am I, send me. Send me. It's a very personal thing. Just where are you going? What are you going to do?